Hi, thank you for tuning in. My name is Ian Smith. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo, and today I'm narrating the video summary for our paper, Potentiation in Mouse Lumbrical Muscle Without Myosin Light Chain Phosphorylation. Is resting calcium responsible? Muscle contraction is the result of a change in cell membrane potential, which propagates across the sarcolemma and down into the T-tubules. Here it triggers calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the cytosol. Cytosolic calcium can then bind to regulatory proteins found on the thin filament, exposing myosin binding sites found on actin. This allows for the formation of cross bridges and force production. Continuously during this time, calcium is resequestered into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and eventually calcium is returned back to resting homeostatic levels. Thus, the force of a contraction depends both on the characteristics of the calcium signal that trigger the contraction, and also the sensitivity of the contractile proteins to that calcium signal. This is important for the fast twitch specific property of force potentiation. Potentiation describes an elevation in submaximal force, such as that seen during a twitch contraction, that's brought about by previous muscle activity. In this slide, the second twitch is potentiated by the titanic contraction and has higher force than the first twitch. Thus, the second twitch is a potentiated twitch. The primary mechanism for potentiation is an increase in the calcium sensitivity of the contractile proteins that's mediated by phosphorylation of the myosin regulatory light chain. In resting skeletal muscle, the average position of the myosin head is close to the thick filament backbone. Calcium released out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the cytosol can bind to calmodulin, which can in turn bind to the skeletal muscle isoform of myosin light chain kinase. This activates the enzyme, and in the presence of ATP, phosphorylates the regulatory light chain found at the base of the myosin head. This causes the average position of the myosin head to move away from the thick filament and closer to the thin filament. During a subsequent contraction, this closer interaction increases the rate at which cross bridges transition from the non-force producing to force producing states, illustrated here as an increase in F apparent. It does this without affecting the rate of the reverse transition from the force producing to the non-force producing states, which is illustrated here as G apparent. Since the fraction of cross bridges producing force is equal to F apparent divided by the sum of F apparent and G apparent, an increase in F apparent increases the fraction of force producing cross bridges. Thus, regulatory light chain phosphorylation effectively acts as a catalyst for cross bridge formation and force production. This potentiating effect can last for several minutes after a single bout of contraction and ends whenever myosin targeting phosphatase dephosphorylates the regulatory light chain and the myosin head returns to its original position close to the thick filament. In the absence of regulatory light chain phosphorylation, such as is seen in myosin light chain kinase null mice, post-titanic potentiation is also absent. This isn't the whole story, though. These transgenic animals still exhibit potentiation in response to repetitive low-frequency stimulation, known as staircase potentiation. In the graph with the wild hip muscles shown in gray and the myosin light chain kinase null muscles shown in black, you can see that there is still a potentiation effect in the knockout muscle, although it's diminished somewhat compared to their wild-type counterparts. Since force is the result of both calcium sensitivity and the calcium signal, we hypothesized that there could be a change in the calcium signal, which acts as a secondary mechanism complementary to the effects of regulatory light chain phosphorylation that leads to potentiation of contraction. To investigate this hypothesis, lumbrical muscles from wild-type mice were dissected from the hind feet and mounted between a force transducer and a servo motor in a circulating oxygenated physiological salt solution at 37 degrees Celsius. The muscles were then loaded with a cell permeable calcium sensitive fluorescent dye, either Furaptra to examine the cytosolic calcium transients, or Fura2 to examine resting cytosolic calcium between twitches. The muscle was then subjected to a sequence of control twitches occurring every 30 seconds, followed by a potentiation inducing stimulus of 20 Hz for 2.5 seconds. Potentiated twitches were then measured at select time points after the end of the potentiation-inducing stimulus. To determine what was happening to the cytosolic calcium concentration during the contractions, fluorescent light signals were collected before and after the potentiating stimulus. To examine the effectiveness of the potentiation-inducing stimulus at actually causing potentiation, we examined force tracings. Here we saw the classic signs of potentiation. First, twitch force was increased by 17% after the potentiating stimulus and this is illustrated in panel B, with the bars in black representing those occurring before the potentiating stimulus, and the bars in white representing those that occur after the potentiating stimulus. Not only were potentiated twitches stronger, they were also faster, and we report faster times to peak tension and faster half relaxation times. What's unusual, though, is that these were very short-lived effects, lasting only 20 to 30 seconds. For comparison, in extensor digitorum longus muscles, potentiation can last upwards of 10 to 20 minutes. 
Next, we examined regulatory light chain phosphorylation in EDL and lumbrical muscles. In the unpotentiated state, EDL muscles had low levels of regulatory light chain phosphorylation, and this increased following the potentiating stimulus. Conversely, lumbrical muscles had no signs of regulatory light chain phosphorylation in either the unpotentiated or potentiated states. Similarly, Western blotting data revealed that relative to EDL, the lumbrical muscles had low levels of myosin light chain kinase and high levels of myosin targeting phosphatase. The kinase phosphatase profile of lumbrical was actually very similar to that of the soleus, and the soleus doesn't potentiate. These findings were very surprising considering that potentiation is associated with fast twitch muscle, and our characterization of myosin heavy chain expression for the lumbrical revealed that it's predominantly composed of fast type 2X fibers. For comparison, the EDL is predominantly fast type 2B fibers, while soleus is mainly the slower type 1 and 2A fibers. Thus, in mice, it's possible that only type 2B fibers exhibit potentiation via regulatory light chain phosphorylation. Looking now at the furoptera-derived calcium transients, which are shown as the peaks on the left-hand side of the screen in solid lines, we see no differences in either the amplitude or the shape of the calcium transient following the potentiating stimulus. This is in stark contrast to the large changes that we see in the force records, shown here as dotted lines. If you recall, we see higher force and faster kinetics in the potentiated state. Therefore, calcium transients can't mechanistically be explaining what's happening to the force records during potentiation. Conversely, FURA2 light signals collected immediately prior to the onset of each twitch contraction revealed a highly significant increase in the resting cytosolic calcium following the potentiating stimulus. These remained elevated for 30 seconds, mirroring the changes seen in the peak force and kinetics during potentiation. We repeated these experiments using a different dye, Indo-1, and found the exact same pattern. Thus, we have a putative mechanism for potentiation in the absence of myosin regulatory light chain phosphorylation. Namely, contractile activity causes an increase in cytosolic calcium, subthreshold for force production, which can contribute to isometric twitch force potentiation. This effect is reversed when cytosolic calcium is returned to homeostatic levels. Future research in this area will focus on examining calcium during the buildup phase of potentiation, along with determining functional consequences of this regulatory light chain phosphorylation independent potentiation. We don't know how increasing resting calcium specifically affects the contractile apparatus to cause this type of potentiation, nor do we know the mechanism behind how prolonged elevations in resting calcium can occur. Both these questions warrant further investigation. I hope you've enjoyed this video summary along with the paper. Thanks very much for watching.